Tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We are thoroughly combing this area, um, you know, as it relates to public safety. The search for a suspect a day after a transit cop is shot at a Surrey Skytrain station. Plus. It is a bit heartbreaking, and especially since um, they're using religion of all things. Caught on camera, a Burnaby porch pirate using prayer to steal packages. And. I had to have a lot of courage to stand up and address us all. Emotional apology. The truck driver responsible for the Humboldt Broncos bus tragedy addresses the families of the victims. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. We begin tonight in Surrey, where the hunt is still on for a suspect in a shooting of a transit police officer. It happened at Scott Road Station during the busy rush hour commute home. And more than 24 hours later, an entire neighborhood is still taped off. That's where our Tina Lovegreen is live tonight. Tina, why are police still there? Anita Mike, police received a tip from the public that indicated the suspect might have ran into this neighborhood after yesterday's shooting. The Scott Road Skytrain station is just up the road, and even right now, I can see police cars just making the rounds here, going in circles, searching for the suspect. And all day today, armed police officers were going door to door in search of the suspect. They were stopping every car, every resident, asking them to show ID. Anyone who doesn't live in the area is asked to stay away. And for most of the night yesterday, this area was on lockdown. So some residents had to sneak in. Have a listen. I came back down here at 9 o'clock last night to come home, and I couldn't get into my neighborhood. They said nobody in or out. But I managed to sneak around through the back way. And, uh, well, it was lit up like a Christmas tree because there was cop cars up and down the street. I mean, they were almost bumper to bumper all the way from the turf all the way to Highway 17. And then all the way around, like I said, you know, there was a lot of cop cars. Now, others like res other residents like Shannon Walker, who I spoke to, say they were too scared to come home. So she spent the day at her sister's house far, far away from this neighborhood. Take a listen. I didn't want to stay down there because I don't know what's happening. They aren't letting anybody know. They are not going and being like, OK, we have the person in this area. It's OK. You're safe over here. Now, police say they understand that residents are concerned. After all, the shooting took place at four in the afternoon inside the station, uh, the SkyTrain station, where hundreds of people are coming in and out. But they say that they can't reveal much more information because the shooting is still under investigation. But we have seen a very large police uh, response to this shooting. And here is Surrey RCMP Corporal Eleanor Starko on why. Of course, having a law enforcement officer it hits a little bit close to home for us as law enforcement. But we're talking about people, regardless of the job that you do, whenever there is a, a shooting, uh, whenever we have serious incidents, it's people first. And we will give the response that is required based on the information that we have and the situation that would dictate those resources. And the, Sur uh, the Scott Road Skytrain station, rather, is now open, but transit police were handing out flyers with the suspect's face on it. His face is plastered all over the station there. And the suspect description, I'll read it to you one more time. He's a man in his 20s with dark skin and a dark stubble goatee with a mustache. And he was last seen wearing a blue hoodie. Anyone who sees him is asked to stay away. Do not approach him and call 911 instead. He is he may be armed and dangerous. And um, I should also mention that we heard from Burnaby RCMP earlier today. They said they had arrested someone at the Edmund Skytrain station, someone who matched the description of the suspect. But after the suspect was taken or after that individual individual was taken to the Surrey detachment, it was determined that he was not the suspect. Okay, Tina, and what about the transit police officer who was shot? Do we know how he's doing tonight? 
Well, we know that 27-year-old Constable Joshua Harms has been released from Royal Columbian Hospital. We don't know where he was shot, but we know that his injuries were serious but not life-threatening. We also know that he has to go back to see a specialist to figure out the extent of his injuries and to see what kind of treatment options are available to him. Mike, Anita? Tina Lovegreen live in Surrey tonight. Thanks, Tina. Well, did we pay too much for the Trans Mountain Pipeline? A senior number cruncher in Ottawa thinks taxpayers did maybe by as much as a billion dollars. As the CBC's Zara Premji explains tonight, some critics say that money could have been spent in Canadian communities that need help. Pipeline critics think Ottawa should have negotiated harder before handing over $4.5 billion. Absolutely frustrated uh, at the position that our uh, federal government has taken. Eugene Kung is with West Coast Environmental Law. He says the Trans Mountain Pipeline project seems to have sucked away $1 billion more than it should have from taxpayers' pockets. You know, for a billion dollars, you could uh, make every First Nations Reserve have drinkable water. This after the parliamentary budget officer went through a report showing the federal Liberals likely overpaid for the Trans Mountain Pipeline project almost at the sticker price of $4.6 billion instead of bargaining it down. Economist Helmut Pastrick says when you look at the $1 billion, it may feel like a waste of money, but he thinks the extra dollars are necessary to ensure the success of the pipeline project. Obviously, the longer it is delayed, uh, the, the uh, immediate the value uh, does, does decline, uh, but uh, it's very likely that it will uh, pay for itself. That's just simply factually not correct. It's, it's wishful thinking at best, and it's really dangerous to make public policy based on wishful thinking. Kung says this money is gone whether we like it or not. And he fears as potential benefits dwindle with inevitable construction delays, more money may be yanked from the pockets of taxpayers. The parliamentary budget officer says whatever way you look at it, the federal government has taken on a risky venture. The risks are significant for taxpayers, but... Should this get built, it will be a relief for the oil sector in Alberta because it will, um, it will accelerate the, um, the opening of markets for Canadian oil. However, Pastrick says from an economic perspective, he believes over the 50-plus years he expects a pipeline to be in existence, the benefits will definitely outweigh the costs. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the dust is starting to settle on the Nanaimo by-election, and while it didn't tip the balance of power in the legislature, it has put all three parties on very different trajectories. Our provincial affairs reporter Tanya Fletcher tells us how the results from that one riding could still change the political landscape. The Nanaimo by-election has given the NDP confidence and momentum. The loss for the Liberals leaves them looking to go out with the old and in with the new. And the dismal turnout for the Greens has launched that party into an existential crisis. That leaves us with the big question now, where does this leave the NDP Green Alliance? So I'm confident our relationship will continue to be as it has been, rocky some days, but at the end of the day, we focus on what's best for people. A mild response from John Horgan met by an explosive response from Andrew Weaver. He says this by-election marks a turning point for the Greens to stand up to the NDP. Moving into the spring session, we are not serving on seven committees anymore. That is just not happening anymore. It is not physically possible. You've got enough backbench or MLAs that you need to put them to work. And frankly, they need to do the work on the committees because what frustrates us as Greens is we're often the only ones doing the work on the committees as well. Clearly frustrated, but not ready to make the results of this vote the catalyst for an election. A day after statement from the Green Party reads, Our biggest challenge in the lead up to the next general election in 2021 is finding a way to articulate our distinct vision. This is not just a question of how we're different from the NDP, but how we are fundamentally different from both of the other parties. So what about that other party? Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson suggests this by-election signals a new dawn for his party. I'm aware of three of our MLAs so far who have indicated they're not running again. There may be more coming, but it's a chance for renewal. It's a new face for the party. We've got a new approach to things and we're very excited about the future as this is a very unstable coalition government now. In the end, the Nanaimo by-election did not upset the status quo within the B.C. legislature. But as the spring sitting nears, the shifting undercurrents promise to set the scene for yet another dramatic session. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Vancouver.
It's another step forward in a plan to build SkyTrain to UBC. Vancouver City Councilors have voted 9-2 to two in favor of the proposal, which extends the Broadway subway line by four stops, ending at the university. It's estimated the project will cost somewhere between $3.3 billion and $3.8 billion before inflation. Where those funds come from, though, it's not clear. The new extension is expected to be up and running by 2025. Praise the Lord and steal the package. That's what a thief in Burnaby's been doing. As the CBC's Tina Levgreen reports, the pamphlet-toting porch pirate is going door-to-door, -door, ripping people off. At first, it looks like he's just dropping off a flyer, but the homeowner says what happens next is far from that. And then you see him in the video coming back a second time. That's when he went and he opened the box and then went rummaging through it and then took the items that he wanted and then he walked off. He walked off with two items from her Amazon delivery, a game controller and a watch strap, leaving behind the diapers and this flyer, inviting them to a religious event. It is a bit heartbreaking, and especially since um, they're using religion of all things to, you know, mask their, their thievery. She says he was undeterred by the two surveillance cameras and was using the religious pamphlets as a cover. If someone was home that, you know, if, if they're like, what are you doing? He'd be like, oh, sorry, I just dropped off this pamphlet for you. We decided to drive to the address on the flyer. 20 minutes later, we ended up here in East Vancouver. But we were told to talk to police because it's a criminal matter. Burnaby RCMP say it's looking into it. His focus is definitely on the boxes. Meanwhile, the homeowners have posted the surveillance video online as a warning to others. Save heartbreak for another family for him doing this because for us, it was just a few items here and there. But for somebody else, it might be something big for them. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Burnaby. An early morning fire partially shut down 104 Avenue in Surrey. Crews were called to the abandoned home shortly after 5 a.m. and were on scene for several hours. Two-story building suffered extensive damage. No injuries have been reported. Just what sparked the fire remains unclear. Crews are still investigating. And Joe Hanaway staff joins us now with the first look at the weather. Oh, and she's right here. I was looking for you. <laughs> yeah, where are you? <laughs> surprise! <laughs> the forecast hopefully won't be quite as a surprise. So <laughs> let, let me gear you up for a few uh, big changes over the next five to seven days. We have to get through rain, dropping temperatures, and we alluded to it yesterday, some snow in the long-range forecast. Let me start you off with the currents out there right now. Seven at YVR, uh, seven's out towards Pitt Meadows and Abbotsford. A little warmer tonight than where we were last night, thanks to all that cloud cover. The rain is moving in, though. We're starting to see the first bands cross the strait, filling in for Vancouver Island. I'd say in the next hour or so, look for those sprinkles to become a steadier rounds of rain, looking at rain to continue through the overnight and through most of our Friday. Just wanted to take you through the big picture across the province, though. The center of the low is offshore. The warm front is actually pushing up through Prince George right now uh, into a very cold air mass that's in place. So we're, we've got the cold front moving through our neck of the woods. The warm front, though, is what is bringing some pretty wicked winter weather to parts of the province. We're starting to get into some of that polar vortex, a very cold air mass for the northern and central sections. We have winter storm warnings in place for up to 40 to 50 centimeters of snow for some of the interior mountain ranges, freezing rain for Williams Lake and snow down to the southern interior. So this isn't what we're getting. I will take you through the much less snow in our long range forecast. Talk more about uh, this doozy coming up. All right, Joe, thanks very much. You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. And just a reminder, you can watch this show live or anytime online on Facebook, YouTube, uh, and, and our website. Just search CBC Vancouver to find us on either of those platforms. And remember to subscribe, comment, and share our content while you're there. An emotional day at the sentencing hearing for the man responsible for the Humboldt Broncos bus crash. Jess Garrett Sadu stood up and addressed the victim's families. What he said coming up. And hi there to everyone watching online tonight. For tonight's Throwback Thursday, we're taking you back to 1991. 
a time when $1,000 bills were still in circulation. Mm. Mm -hmm. Former CBC reporter Helen Griffiths went out with one in hand to see what she could do with the money. money. Thank you. <laughs> I don't take that. Oh, small. No, not in this store. Seven sixty-three. Really? Forty dollars. Like to buy it, please. I don't think I have change for that either. I, I can't buy that. Wallet with this? No, you wouldn't be able to. No, you wouldn't have that amount of money in the till. It's real. I know. But it's too big for me. You can't take it. No. Are you really want to change it? Would you be able to take me to CBC with this? Oh, I guess so. <laughs> Do you have with the... that? No. Judging by the price and the GST, they'll become very, very common, I'm sure. <laughs> it's a thousand dollar bill. Would you carry one of those around with you? Ah, uh, no. How come? Because it's too large. You might lose it. And that's that. I honestly can't say when I've used I have used them before, but usually when I don't want to carry around a lot of uh, hundred dollar bills. Have you seen one of these before? No. <laughs> You're holding it pretty firmly there. <laughs> I'd like to go somewhere warm and sunny for a week. Oh, for a week? Okay. And leaving um, tonight if I can. Really how much would Cancun be? Well, Aaron Hotel for one week, leaving tonight is $499. Okay, okay, that's fine. And how would you be making your payment? Uh, cash. Cash? Okay. Why don't I just take that $577? Okay. $1,000. Okay. No problem at all. Thank you. Finally, someone wants to take my money. My flight goes in three hours. Just enough time to pack. What a tough day at the office, eh? <laughs> now you can just tap. Who carries cash? Well, I know. Even if you try to use a $100 bill, sometimes yeah. you can't. Yeah break that. Mm -hmm. And interesting to know, the $1,000 bill was actually taken out of circulation nine years ago mm. to help fight organized crime. That kind of makes sense. Money yeah. laundering and all that, for yeah. sure. Remember the $1 bill and the $2? They were yeah. long gone. The good old brown $2 bill, yeah. Right. We're going to be back with uh, more news in just a few moments right here. This was a day many of the victims' families had been waiting for. The truck driver responsible for the Humboldt Broncos bus crash stood up and took a deep breath before addressing the courtroom. Just Kirat Singh Sidhu was the last person to speak at his sentencing hearing. And as the CBC's Karen Pauls reports, his comments come after days of emotional victim impact statements. Families of the victims arrived this morning bracing to hear what the Crown and Defence would recommend as a sentence for Jaskarit Singh Sidhu. There were sobs from the gallery when Crown Prosecutor Thomas Healy recommended a 10-year sentence for each charge of dangerous driving, all to be served at the same time, plus a 10-year driving ban. Then defence lawyer Mark Brayford walked through the hours before the crash, providing answers to questions the families have been asking. The morning of April 7th, Sidhu stopped to pick up two trailers of peat moss. As he was driving away, the tarps on the top of the trailers started flapping in the wind. He stopped to adjust them, but then drove the next 10 to 15 minutes focused on that. Sidhu's lawyer says he didn't deliberately drive through the stop sign. He just missed it. Defense lawyer Mark Brayford didn't recommend a sentence. He says there's a range for these kinds of cases in Saskatchewan. If it's not involving impairment, one death, the range is one and a half years to four and a half years. Then the most dramatic moment of the day, Sidhu stood to address the families directly. He cried. He gripped the table in front of him. He told them he could still hear the crying of the players as he got out of that semi-truck. I take full responsibility of what has happened, he said. It happened because of my lack of experience. And I'm so, 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 so sorry. Really, I think we're really somewhat conflicted. 
Um, you, you want justice, but at the same time, there's no doubt in our minds that, that uh, Mr. Sadu is remorseful. He's just a little bit older than my son. And, uh, he had to have a lot of courage to stand up and address us all. Judge Inez Cardinal will give her sentence March 22nd. There is some question about what this will all mean for Sadu. Because he's a permanent resident and not a citizen of Canada, it may mean his removal. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Melfort. Well, the party is languishing in the polls. Its money is in short supply. And as many as nine MPs won't be running for re-election this fall. It's a tough time for the federal NDP. And as Hannah Thibodeau reports tonight, the party's members are saying it's do or die for Jagmeet Singh. He needs to win the upcoming Burnaby by-election or probably be out of a job. Well, my name is Jagmeet Singh. I'm the leader of the NDP. Just want to say hi. As he campaigns in Burnaby South, some say Jagmeet Singh is in the fight of his political life. It is self-evident that if you lose a by-election, if you cannot win in the People's Republic of Burnaby, where can you win? CBC News has learned that senior NDP MPs made that message clear to Singh last summer when he was contemplating running in the BC riding. At least two veteran MPs told him failure in Burnaby was not an option. He had to be all in and his leadership rides on it. Another seven MPs from three provinces tell CBC without a victory, the leader will not have the legitimacy to remain. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Thanks so much. Despite that, there. Singh has said he would stay on, even if he loses. Yeah, I will be the leader that leads uh, the new Democratic Party into the 2019 election. In public, his team is behind him. Uh, I'm very confident he's going to win. I'm, I'm confident uh, Jack Mead Singh uh, will be a uh, member of parliament and will, uh, will win uh, Burnaby South. Privately, the NDP have constructed a plan B if he loses. One possible scenario, MPs choose an interim leader from within because of financial issues and with the clock ticking down to the October election. This former NDP MP says the planning is simply due diligence. I would think that's just good sound management to, to want to have contingency plans for whatever happens. We got Don out here too. The question is, Brother. even if Singh wins, does that put doubts about his leadership to rest? Some think it should. I'm looking to that being, having a lot of positive benefits, including on our fundraising and our general polling numbers. I think everything will be better once Jack meets in the house. That remains the goal. I'm confident we're gonna win here. I'm confident that people are feeling let down by Mr. Trudeau's government. Asked repeatedly today if he would remain leader if he doesn't win, he refused to answer. But if Singh does win, his job will get even tougher. To prove himself in the House of Commons in front of his opponents in a daily national audience. To quell a bubbling caucus still concerned about his leadership. And to prepare for a federal election just months away. Something he has never done. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. An important ruling from the Supreme Court of Canada today for the energy sector and the environment. It says companies that, must, that go bankrupt must fulfill their environmental obligations before paying back creditors. The case involves an Alberta-based company that went out of business in 2015. Redwater Energy left behind 12 active oil and gas wells, 72 inactive wells, and $5 million in debt. Its trustee wanted to sell the active wells to pay off the bankers and leave the rest for Alberta's Orphan Well Association. To clean up, the uh, court ruled bankruptcy does not mean companies can ignore environmental regulations. Two elite French police officers have been convicted of gang raping a Canadian tourist almost five years ago. The victim, who has agreed to be identified, is the daughter of a Toronto police officer. The CBC's Kayla Hounsel has more from London. The two officers found guilty of raping Canadian Emily Spanton have each been sentenced to seven years in prison. Spanton, who is the daughter of a Canadian police officer, was in Paris today to hear the verdict. She says she met the officers at a Paris pub in 2014. They offered to give her a tour of the police headquarters and she agreed. 
That's where the assault took place. She left distraught and approached another officer to report the incident. The charges were originally dismissed, but a French appeal court overturned the decision and sent the case to trial. Following their conviction today, the officer's lawyers said they will be appealing the verdict tomorrow. Their clients say what happened that night was consensual. This verdict is not fair. Uh, this rape is a, is a lie. They are innocent. They are sleeping tonight in jail, but they are innocent. The speech of Mrs. Penters has been confirmed by objective elements from the file. And the judgment is built from that, these uh, objective elements. That's the reason why it's a fair and mot a well-motivated judgment. The officers were part of a unit specializing in tracking down gang members and terrorists. They were from the same unit that entered the Bataclan Theater to rescue hostages during the 2015 Paris terror attacks. And so this case is getting a lot of attention in France, where it is really considered a national scandal. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, London. It was a haven for the homeless in Surrey. Coming up, why, even though it's gone, it has left behind a complicated legacy. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News.
When your movements are restricted in your own neighborhood, it kind of makes you wonder. Entire neighborhoods taped off as police search for a suspect in the shooting of a transit cop at Scott Road Skytrain Station in Surrey. It happened yesterday evening during the commuter rush, and the suspect is described as a man in his 20s with dark skin and stubble. You can go to our website for more information. I think Canadians deserve to know what uh, is at stake and what is at risk. The Liberal government may have overpaid for the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project by up to $1 billion, at least according to new estimates. The parliamentary budget officers says there's risk its value could decline even further if there are more delays on construction. There's no doubt in our minds that, that uh, Mr. Sidhu is remorseful. A truck driver who pleaded guilty in the Humboldt Broncos bus crash has apologized to the victim's families in court. Just Kirit Sidhu stood up, took a deep breath, and said he takes full responsibility for what happened. Some families cried, some looked down, and others stared at him as he said he will be so, so, so sorry from this day. <laughs> for the homeless right in the heart of Surrey. But while the so-called strip was dismantled months ago, court documents show its complicated legacy lives on. The CBC's Jason Proctor has more. Ken Friesen's Surrey home looks like something off a handyman antique lover's reality TV show with its manicured lawns and lovingly salvaged old furniture until you notice the security measures. All of a sudden, bang. You got all the drug dealers, crackheads, all hanging around the strip. And then the strip got more and more and more, and they just branch out. Friesen has lived here for 30 years, just blocks from what was the Surrey Strip, a longtime tent encampment and drug use hotspot. A search warrant we picked up at Surrey Court reveals the unintended impact of a plan to clean up the notorious strip last July by moving residents from tents into modular homes and shelters. According to the warrant, when the Surrey Strip was dismantled, that disruption provided opportunities to persons selling illicit drugs out of houses. The traffic started migrating to the corner of this, you know, otherwise quiet neighborhood, where suddenly neighbors start saying there's just a stream of people coming in constantly to come and get drugs. There's like video cameras on the edge of this house. They say there were rules posted inside as to, you know, how to behave when you're inside so you don't attract uh, attention from police. A naloxone kit inside to make sure, you know, that people didn't OD. The alleged crack shack featured in the search warrant has now shut down. The Surrey Strip's problems have also disappeared from sight, but neighbors like Friesen say they're still dealing with the underlying issues. I had to put a six foot high up fence up in my backyard to keep up the pe keep out the people. They'd still still me blind. This way it'll stop, deter people from coming up. Yeah, it does a bit. RCMP officer Trevor Dinwoody has spent his entire career in the Wally area and was part of the cleanup last July. Part of our planning when we were planning to move uh, the residents of 135A Street into the modular units and into surrounding shelters, Good morning. We, uh, we anticipated that there would be a shift in uh, nuisance incidents, uh, the, the, the drug crime in the area, but it's something that we endeavor to work towards um, always solving those issues. Friesen doubts anything in his backyard is going to improve at this point. One possibility he's not excited about is a change in policing. I hate to say it, but the stupid idea of this new mayor of getting rid of the RCMP, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Okay. And I don't agree with it. They're here, they're established, they know the people, leave them here. You can get all these new cops in here that don't know diddly squat, they don't know the, they don't know the neighborhood, they don't know the people and it's going to take years for them to get ahead of anything. We've really been blessed with the residents of this community. They've seen it, they've dealt with it, they've, I mean, my entire career has been in Wally, and they've seen it that entire time, and now we're developing this different strategy, we're going in a different direction, and they see, um, they see the positivity. Yeah. High five? Yeah. Jason Proctor, CBC News, Surrey. Well, that is the beautiful downtown Vancouver at 6.33 on this Thursday evening.
The clear skies are no more. Get ready for the rain to ramp up. Johanna is here with your full forecast next. Toronto, like much of the country, is in the grips of a deep, deep freeze. Mm. That's right. Wind chill values of minus 30 expected to stick around until at least tomorrow night. CBC's Chris Glover has more behind the cold and why it's not an indicator that global warming has stopped. It's the kind of cold you have to feel to understand. I can barely see in there. Oh, oh okay. It's pretty cold out here, hey? Yeah, it's pretty cold. <laughs> this is Jerry Shaw's first Canadian winter. I feel like I'm dying, like, like walking outside. I don't know, I think it's a little dangerous because like some people weren't really prepared for it. Oh my God, it's freezing. Like you come outside and it's almost like it takes your breath away and you just immediately want to get somewhere warm. The polar vortex is nothing new. It encircles the North Pole with frigid air, but since 2014, it's been icing cities further and further south. NASA imagery from Tuesday shows how unusually far south Arctic air is this week. What do you think causes all this extreme cold weather? Oh, I, I really don't have any idea. <laughs> well, I believe climate change 100%. I totally believe that. U.S. President Trump thinks global warming has frozen in its tracks. This week, he tweeted for it to come back fast. Of that. What do you make of a tweet like that from the president? Yeah, so obviously Donald is confusing weather and climate. So weather is what happens from day to day, and some days it's cold like today, and some days it's warm. The climate is longer-term averages of the weather. And How common is that confusion? I think it's quite common people see a day like today and say where is exactly that. But the point is, is that you know, when you look over 10 or 20 or 30 years, Toronto is warming up. NASA says 17 of the warmest years in the planet's record books all occurred since 2001 and 2016 was the warmest. And that heat could be leading to our deep chill. Because there's these very, very large scale waves in the atmosphere. They have wavelengths of maybe three or 4,000 kilometers and they move air north and south. There is an idea that as we warm the climb the temperature the earth up, the wavelength of these waves may be getting larger, so the cold air can get farther south. So we, we may be experiencing things that we wouldn't experience before. 2018 was a dramatic weather year. In May, a windstorm left 300,000 Ontario customers in the dark. BC battled 2,000 wildfires due to some of the hottest and driest months on record. 
In September, a Category 3 tornado with winds of 265 kilometers an hour hit Ottawa Gatineau. In the States, 160 kilometer an hour winds whipped the Northeast in March. Then, record crushing heat in California fueled the state's worst wildfires. And who could forget when Hurricane Michael pummeled Florida? Uh, we could be seeing more extreme uh, uh, events. It could just be that we're more in tune to them because they're impacting us more and more now. This University of Toronto physics professor says scientists know the planet is warming and there's more precipitation. So these, these changes are, 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 are happening. Uh, they're just an indication that the climate is changing and we need to do something about it because uh, these things have become more extreme. That is the CBC's Chris Glover reporting from a downright chilly Toronto. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's important to make that distinction between global warming and climate change. People tend to lump them all together. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And it's a conversation that a lot of people have been asking questions about over the past few days. So I'm glad it's prompted uh, science talk, mm -hmm. always. Love the science talk. Yes, I do. <laughs> Never be disappointed. <laughs> Uh, shall we continue on the science talk? Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know we've uh, we've already talked the past couple of days about the impending snow in our forecast. Let me take you through the time lapse. The uh, sort of last of the dry starts for a few days anyway. Uh, gray skies meant we got to keep our temperatures a little warmer than normal uh, thanks to the cloud cover to kick off our Thursday. This time tomorrow, though, uh, things will be pretty soggy out there. I want to start off with those warnings again. We mentioned them at the uh, top of the show winter storm warnings in place as well as freezing rain and snowfall for the BC interior all the way across the Rockies and into Alberta. This is as that polar vortex collides with the Pacific system. So here's the big picture. The contours in the background are the current temperatures and then I've put the current wind chills on top because there is quite a brisk wind. But you can see everywhere that the temperature contours are pink or white. That's where temperatures are sort of below the minus 30 range. And it's starting to inch westward. So starting to see that cold air push into BC, that's what's colliding with the moisture to create those winter storm conditions. And eventually, we will see what uh, is known here in BC as the Arctic outflow setup. So we won't get into the true core of the polar vortex in Vancouver for next week, but we will see as some of those cold, uh, that cold air mass filter through the valleys and inlets out towards the coast. And that's where we're looking to get some of our coldest air yet. So a few days before we get into that, first we have to get through the rain down to a five tonight, so even milder than where we were at last night, back up to an eight. Seasonals, by the way, uh, based on our last 30 years anyway, uh, around six, seven degrees for YVR. So we are coming in above for the next couple of days. Uh, rainfall accumulations, fairly substantial to end off the week. Uh, we could be looking at 15 to 25 millimeters. Oh, I meant to move this uh, legend for you. 15 to 25 millimeters in the green for Metro Vancouver, much higher amounts towards the North Shore and looking at to get some fresh local mountain snow really uh, kicking in tomorrow evening. Okay, so big picture. The reason why there are winter storm warnings in place, not just snowfall, uh, the winds. They will be uh, quite extreme and they're bringing wind chills in through Dees Lake, Fort Nelson, uh, the Peace Region, down to about minus 36 for tomorrow morning. Watch all of that snow continue to ramp up for central and northern sections of the province as I take you through Friday. It really isn't until Friday overnight into Saturday that we start to see that snow ease and we start to get on the other side of that low pressure system for Vancouver as well. So a drier weekend ahead. But as I take you through the long range, I've kept the risk for a few showers in there on Saturday. I still don't think it's out of the question we could see some sunny breaks on Saturday. Uh, it's a drier day anyway than the day we'll have tomorrow. Sunday, yes. There is a chance of some flurries through the day. I don't see a big snow event at this point, but look at those temperatures early next week. That's why there's the concern for snow midweek. That's some cold, I should say coldest air we've had yet. Mm -hmm. Get ready. So to drag out the shovel, the salt and everything? Drag it all out, gloves, really? toque. Just put it all away. I'm ready. I know you are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, and I've Jeff. got I've got all the toques and everything. You're good prepared. To go, so I'll, you're ready. I'll you're make ready. sure that you're good to go too. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Jeff. This weather update is brought to you by your local Remax agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a Remax agent. Another disturbing case of alleged sexual abuse in Manitoba's foster care system. Coming up, what the Child Welfare Agency did after learning about the allegations.
CBC News has uncovered another disturbing case of alleged sex abuse in Manitoba's foster care system, this time involving four young girls. As Katie Nicholson tells us, even after police told child welfare officials about the allegations, the agency kept the kids in the home for months. What does it take to shut down a foster home or to have children removed from a foster home after sexual abuse allegations arise? In this particular case, child welfare officials in Manitoba are coming up short providing answers. This case involves four girls. The first girl reported sexual abuse to Winnipeg police in December of 2016. Winnipeg police confirmed they immediately alerted child welfare officials. Two weeks later, the foster father was allowed to leave the country on a trip with two of the foster daughters. The second girl came forward to police in January of 2017 saying she too had been abused. In February, Winnipeg police charged the foster father with multiple sexual offenses and still foster children remained in the home. Police say the abuse against one of the girls who was nine continued until May when the agency finally removed the children. The children involved in the abuse allegations all fell under Indigenous welfare authorities. We share the details of this case with the First Nations family advocate, Cora Morgan. It's unbelievable to me. It's, it's just negligence, pure negligence, leaving the, the, that child there. They should have all been removed. According to evidence heard in court, the foster father abused two of the girls over a six-year period, during which he built a shed in the backyard with a mattress where some of the abuse occurred. The Child Welfare Authority overseeing the agency that licensed the home refused an interview on how this happened or what, if any, actions it has taken since. In a statement, it says agencies have the authority to come up with a safety plan to keep kids in the home. The Minister of Families also declined an interview but said she is monitoring the case. This is the third report of sexual abuse in a foster care home in Manitoba uncovered by CBC News since November. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Winnipeg. It was designed in 1971 as a way of sparking arts creation in Canada and Canadian content has done its job. But as Diane Buckner explains, with more digital content coming and a blurring of creative borders, a rework is underway. Pictures up. Ladies. On location for season three of Kiefer Sutherland's show, Designated Survivor. Shot in a suburban yeah. Toronto studio, a crew of close to 200 people work on the Netflix series. The producer feels lucky to have the space. To shoot in Toronto right now, is, you know, it's difficult to even find a spot to shoot because all the warehouses, everything that could be turned into studio space is studio space right now. Canada's $8 billion production industry is booming like never before. In another studio nearby, a set is under construction for another Netflix series called Lock and Key. Foreign streaming services from Netflix to Amazon to Hulu are creating jobs here, but they make no contribution to the government-sponsored funds that support Canadian content. That's an outrage to some. They are extracting hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue from Canadians with no corresponding obligation to the Canadian system unlike their domestic competitors. The government is concerned as well. Last year, it announced a review of the almost 30-year-old broadcast legislation. Many players, including web giants, are not contributing to the system. So what we want is we want, uh, we want fairness in the system. The review's expert panel has received 2,000 written submissions from interested parties, including one from Netflix that insists any new regulation should unambiguously exclude online services. All of this is taking place in an environment where there is no Canadian content emergency. In Ottawa, this media professor thinks it would be a mistake to impose additional costs on foreign companies, which could be passed on to consumers. And so saying that we're going to increase fees on those services, I think runs the risk of making those services less affordable. On location, many wonder what makes content Canadian these days anyway. Netflix itself is making a lot of shows that are made by Canadian producers and Canadian writers that I would consider CanCon in the traditional sense of the word. 
The expert panel will consider that question too, but Canadians will be kept in suspense about the finale for many months. Recommendations aren't expected till the fall. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Healthcare professionals in Quebec are sounding the alarm about medication for kids with attention deficit disorder. As Simon Nekineshny reports, a new study reveals the province's doctors prescribe drugs for hyperactivity disorder much more than any other province. Megan Kerr has been taking medication since she was in grade one and diagnosed with ADHD. Her mom still tells the story of when they found the right drug. I said to her, the blue pill is too much, it makes me sad, and the orange pill doesn't work enough, but the white pill is just right. And I must have been like in grade two when I said that to her. But some are warning that Quebec doctors are over-prescribing drugs to the province's youth. In an open letter, 45 pediatricians point to two studies commissioned by the province. They found that between 2006 and 2015, the use of drugs like Ritalin shot up from 2.7 to 5.8 percent. That's more than double the average outside of Quebec. Between April 2014 and March 2015, the figure was 6.44 percent, compared to just 2.39 percent for the rest of the country. We see many children who already have uh, medication and we don't even know why it was prescribed. But some pediatricians are worried the letter will create unnecessary fear among patients. Most pediatricians and family doctors are um, have a lot of uh, training for these particular diagnoses, uh, whether it be ADHD or other types of developmental disorders, and I think the families need to trust and discuss with their physician. The province's junior health minister says he'll beef up psychological services in schools. If we have more psychologists, and uh, psychoeducators available in the net in the réseau, uh, these child can be referred to these uh, professionals rather than be given medication right away. Kerr agrees medication may not be for everyone, but it helped her get through school. It wasn't that I was dumb, it's that I had a disability that made it more difficult for me and to have something that was helping me was like a huge relief to me. Simon Akineshny, CBC News, Montreal. Well, at 108 years old, he may be the oldest person in the Maritimes. Yes, he has 25 great-grandchildren and five great-great-grandchildren. Here's how Arnold Hawkins spent his special day. Happy birthday! Happy you! Same to me! <laughs> You're 108 today. Who? You! 108? Yeah, you are. What do you think of that? He was born in 1911. January 30th, 1911. Uh, right here in Beaver Harbor. He grew up here. He went to school just down here beside his, beside his place. Um, and then he, he worked here. He fished out of here. So he's been in Beaver Harbor his whole life. Grant was a very hard worker. And he took care of his family. He was just like, he was such a good dad and everything and took care of his family and just, he's just, he's just been amazing. He's, he's a, he's a great guy. He's very kind, very, very kind. When you were a little boy, daddy, what did you used to play? Their marriage, oh my gosh. They were just, they were never apart. Only when he was out fishing and she would be home, but they never, everything they did, they did together. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Arnold. Happy birthday to you. Dad, how about a kiss? Huh? How about a kiss? Who? Me. Mwah. <laughs> Get a hug, too? <laughs> hug, two, hug, three. Hug, three. <laughs>
And we have breaking news to report now. Surrey RCMP have identified the man suspected of shooting a transit police officer yesterday at Scott Road Station. Dan Barrett is here now live with more details. Dan, what are police saying about the suspect? We know his name now. Surrey RCMP say he is 35-year-old Dayon Gordon Glasgow. Let's show him there. 35 years old. Dark-skinned man, five, point, uh, five feet, five inches tall, 170 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. He was known, to, he has been known to alter his appearance. He was last seen wearing a blue hoodie and white Nike brand running shoes. Police say he has a history of violence, very well known to police, and he is currently on a Canada, wanted on a Canada-wide warrant for being unlawfully at large. Police say this is the suspect who allegedly opened fire on Const uh, Constable Josh Harms yesterday at the Scott Road station, triggering that massive police manhunt. And at this moment, they're still looking for Dayon Gordon Glasgow. People, police remind you that they are still heavily concentrated in the Bridgeview area, King George Boulevard to 114th Avenue and 125A Street to 124th Street. And they will, that, those areas will be continued to check by police. Once again, this is the suspect they're looking for, Dayon Gordon Glasgow, 35, dark-skinned man, 5 feet 5 inches tall, 170 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes, has a history of violence. You are asked to not approach him if you see him, but to call 911 right away. He is wanted on a Canada-wide warrant for being unlawfully at large. Again, he has a history of violence, police say, and he's very well known to them. We'll have the latest on this and anything more we can get from police tonight at 11 o'clock. Anita, Mike? All right, thanks very much, Dan. Important to point out the uh, the public safety concerns that mm -hmm. police had, of course, uh, because uh, uh, he is still believed to be armed and dangerous and perhaps still in that area, but I understand there's also concern that he may be trying to, uh, to flee the province. Mm -hmm. So you're not allowed to approach him, call 911. And you can always find our news program online, cbc.ca slash bc. Dan will be back at 11 o'clock. Have a good night.